Welcome to CS330. Uh, today we'll be talking about offline reinforcement learning and offline multitask reinforcement learning. And these are some of the hottest parts of reinforcement learning these days. There's a lot of progress happening in these fields, so it's, uh, it's an exciting topic. Uh, before we get started, a uh, reminder, uh, the optional homework four is due next Monday. So uh, hopefully you're already working on that. Cool. So if, uh, let's zoom out a little bit. We talked a little bit about multitask reinforcement learning, just reinforcement learning, meta reinforcement learning. But let's just zoom out and kind of see what is the recipe that has worked so far for machine learning in general, for modern machine learning methods. So if we were to zoom out far enough, we need uh, two parts. We need a lot of data. So for instance, the data set of the size of an image net where we have million images or large corpora of text. Like, uh, like we had in the natural language processing example, um, or natural language processing case, uh, all of Wikipedia, for instance. And then we need expressive capable models that are able to digest all of that data. Right? So for computer vision, traditionally, these have been convolutional neural nets. For natural language processing, transformers, now being used also in, in vision and many other applications. Cool. So let's see if um, the reinforcement learning recipe fits into this. So the reinforcement learning recipe looks like this. We need a lot of data and we need expressive capable models. So instead of, in, in terms of expressive cap capable models, it's relatively easy. We can just, uh, we use similar libraries, so we can use the, best, the biggest advancements that we've seen in vision or in language and just apply them to reinforcement learning. So we can use convolutional neural nets, we can use transformers, that's fine. But then when it comes to data, so far the way that we've been discussing reinforcement learning, we have this loop where we are constantly generating data for any given experiment. This is an active learning loop where we go into the world, then we collect some data with our, with our agent, then we fit something to that data, we try to learn something from it, and then we, with this new updated network, we go into the, work, into the world and then collect more data with the agent and we do it over and over again. So this is a little bit different to uh, the supervised learning recipe where we can just access a lot of data that's already available out there. Here we do this actively over and over again. And this is actually a, a limiting factor when it comes to reinforcement learning and the amounts of data we can digest. So it's hard to achieve the same level of generalization that we've seen in supervised learning with this per experiment active learning loop. So what offline reinforcement learning tries to do is try to get rid of this active uh, data collection loop and instead just access big data sets that were collected offline, assuming that we are not able to collect any additional data. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. And hopefully if we can do that, then we can able to access big data sets, digest a lot of data that was collected offline and then see similar exciting generalization results that we've seen in supervised learning. All right, so the plan for today is to first discuss the offline array problem formulation, then talk about some solutions to this problem. Uh, then we'll talk about offline multitask reinforcement learning and how it influences data sharing. And then we'll end on offline goal condition reinforcement learning, which is a really exciting area of research right now. All right, cool. Let's start, let's start with the offline array problem formulation. So if you remember, we had this anatomy of a reinforcement learning algorithm and we went through this a few times now where we first generate samples then we try to fit a model to estimate re return and we have a few different options here, either policy gradient, Q-learning, or we can use model-based methods as well. And then we have one more box that tries to improve the policy given that model that estimates the return. So what we'll try to do in the offline case is we'll, we'll try to, um, move away from this pattern where we keep generating data, where we keep generating samples by running the policy, and instead just access a data set that is already, already available to us. So the, the one thing that we are changing is that we are not allowed to use this orange box anymore. All right, so in order to do this, um, we can use some of the algorithms that we already know, and we've learned about two types of reinforcement learning algorithms, on-policy and off-policy algorithms. And this is just a 
quick reminder slide of what the difference between these two is. So for on-policy algorithms, data has to come from the current policy. So we are constantly collecting data with the freshest policy that we have. It's compatible with all our algorithms, and we can't reuse data from previous policies. We, from previous policies, we have to be collecting the data and using the data from the policy that is the most fresh. And for the off-policy case, data can come from any policy. We don't really care what policy it was collected with. It works with specific RL algorithms, such as value-based methods. And it's much more sample efficient because we can reuse all data. We can do multiple gradient steps on the same data. All right, so, so given these two, do you have any, any uh, idea which one we would use for the offline case, given these, these, these two categoristics, uh, characteristics? Yes? Yeah, so it's probably the off policy case, and instead of data coming from a policy, we'll just use any data. That's right. All right, so we'll be using off-policy RL. Um, but uh, there is a small difference between off-policy RL and offline RL. So here's a little graphic explaining the, the difference. So in the, off, in the online reinforcement learning, just to reiterate this, we have a world that we can collect data on. We do rollouts on this world, so we get the next state and the reward from the world. Then we can execute our policy that gives us the actions, and we do multiple rollouts in this loop. Then we take that rollout data that, that we just generated, and we update the policy using that data, and then we, use, we push the new policy into the world to collect more action, to collect more rollouts. In the off-policy case, there is one more addition, the addition of this replay buffer, where we can collect a bunch of rollouts, and then the rollout data goes into the buffer, and that buffer now consists of all the rollouts that we've, that we've ever had. Right? So it doesn't just need to be the, the most fresh rollout data. This is any, any rollout that we've collected in the, in the history of this experiment. Then we take samples from that buffer to update our policy, and then this updated policy gets to execute and do uh, multiple rollouts in the real world. And now this is the offline reinforcement learning case. So in the offline reinforcement learning case, we assume that the data collected is only once with any policy. And we will call this policy pi beta, policy of the buffer. We don't really know what's, what kind of policy this is. This was collected. We didn't have access to it. It was collected before we even started working on this experiment. It's just we have some data in the buffer already. So we have access to the buffer. Then we can sample from the buffer and learn our policy. And we can use as many gradient steps as we would like. But we can't really collect any additional data. We don't have access to the world to collect additional data that can be used for learning. So instead, we'll be just sampling from the buffer, learning our policy. And then once we are done, we'll just deploy it in the world and see how well it works. All right, so a few notations. Here will be the, the capital D symbol will be referring to the SARS tuples that we have in our, uh, in our replay buffer. So this is the state, action, next state, and the reward. Then our states will come from the marginal state distribution of our policy pi beta. And pi beta is the policy that we have in the buffer. So we don't really know what it is. It's an unknown policy. We don't have any form of it. We just have access to samples from this policy, and this is what we have in the buffer. Right? So the actions that we see in the buffer are the actions that were executed by this unknown policy, and the states that we have in the buffer are the marginal that the policy visited. And then there is a dynamics model that we don't have access to as well. In terms of the objective, it's similar to the standard reinforcement learning objective. We were trying to maximize the future sum of returns and find the argmax of the policy. Um, so in this case, we are summing over all the time steps. And then we are, making, we are taking the expectation under the state distribution that we see in the buffer, actions that we pick according to our policy that we are learning right now, pi theta. And we are trying to maximize the sum of return, the discounted sum of returns. All right. So given all this, can you think of any potential applications of offline reinforcement learning, given the differences to online, off policy, and so on? Yes? Uh, 
maybe when it's expensive or dangerous to like um, play the agent in the apartment. So for example, like medical situations um, where like deploying the agent to try and like for trial and error is just too expensive or too um, costly for the like, have a like a dangerous environment or something like that. Right, yeah, yeah, right. Just to repeat the the, the answer, uh, any time where it's costly or dangerous to collect additional data in the environment, for example, in medical applications or in dangerous environments. Any, any other ideas of applications of offline reinforcement learning? All right, yeah, so it's uh, it basically that covers, I think, most of the cases. So any time when it's very difficult to deploy the agent, this was something where we can just access the data that was already collected, or if it's very difficult to collect that data in the real world, like for instance, as, as you said, in the medical applications, this could be extremely useful and we can find ways to uh, learn from that already collected data to act better in the future, even better than the policy that collected the data. Right, so speaking about offline reinforcement learning and what it can be used for, what can it actually do? How can it work that you can just access some data that was collected previously by some policies and you can somehow extract something from it? So it can do three things. So first, it can just find best behaviors in a data set. So if you have a bunch of different behaviors that was collected by different policies, it can just pick which ones were the best and just use those. Right? That's relatively simple. Secondly, it can also generalize these best behaviors to similar situations. So here we are training this whole thing with uh, deep neural networks, which can generalize quite well. So if we've seen that something worked in a particular situation, now because of the generalization properties of neural networks, we'll be able to apply similar behaviors in similar situations through generalization. And then thirdly, it can also stitch together parts of good behaviors into even a better behavior. And this is maybe a little bit less intuitive. So here's a little example. If we had two trajectories in the buffer, one that goes from A to B and another one that goes from B to C, and we wanted to find the best way that goes from the shortest path that goes from A to C, it should be able to stitch these trajectories such that it uses the first part of trajectory from A to B and the second part of the trajectory from B to C, stitch them together and get a much better trajectory than either one of the ones that we've collected before. And it can do the stitching because of dynamic programming properties of, of offline reinforcement learning. Or another case where we have two points we need to get from this point to that point, and we have lots of noisy trajectories that we collected that go between these points or sometimes don't even, don't even touch any of these points, right? Just lots of noisy trajectories that were somewhat collected. Offline reinforcement learning should be able to stitch these behaviors to find a policy that finds the shortest path between these two points. Right? So we can learn a policy that is better than the data that, than the policy that the data was collected with. All right. So we, talk, we said that uh, we could use off-policy algorithms to, to solve this problem. that are more applicable than on-policy algorithms because they can use any data. So let's try it. Um, we learned about this fitted Q iteration algorithm. It more or less went like this. Um, we have a few algorithm hyperparameters. We have a data set size, a collection policy, and then we are trying to learn a Q function that takes as input state an action and outputs a Q value, a scalar that tells us what's the predicted sum of rewards. And then we are iterating, uh, we are doing gradient steps on, on this objective right here. We are trying to fit the Q function to the target, and the target is, uh, is the reward plus the max over action of the next Q. So this is, um, this is the main equation that we use for this, uh, for the target of our Q function. So we do this over K iterations, and then we'll continue collecting the data set using some policy and do this iteratively. After we do this, we can get the policy by just using the argmax um, over actions from the Q. All right, so a few notes that we noted while we were introducing it. We can reuse data from previous policies, right? So we can use any policy. Here we still do this iteratively, but you can imagine that we just want to do this loop. We'll just access that data set and we will not collect additional data. And it's an off, it was an off-policy algorithm, so we can use replay buffers to 
um, to uh, sample the data from. And it was not a gradient descent algorithm, it was a dynamic programming algorithm. So one question I have to you is, do you remember what this equation was called? This equation that we compute Q targets with? The Bellman equation, that's right. Yeah, Bellman optimality equation, and this is a really important equation. So we'll get back to it in a second. All right, so this is the fitted iteration algorithm. And then we talked about uh, how we can apply this with the Bellman equation uh, to a robotic application, to grasping, and uh, achieve pretty good results. So the way it worked, it was described in this paper called QTOPT, where we would store data from all the past experiments. Then we would have a buffer that, um, that has all the off-policy experiences. In addition to this, we'll collect a little bit of on-policy data and have a separate buffer for that. And then we'll try to train this Q function. We'll have a set of jobs that run in parallel that compute the Bellman update, so they run the Bellman equation. Inside of there, they're also doing cross-entropy minimization to find this max over uh, continuous action space. And then as the result of the Bellman update, we get the label pairs that are then being put um, in the training job to actually apply the gradients to the network. And this actually worked um, quite well. So uh, this we used seven robots that collected over 580,000 grasps. And on unseen test objects, we were able to see some really cool generalization behaviors where the robot was able to singulate the object, uh, do some regrasping behavior, and uh, actually uh, grasp a lot of them. The result that I reported back then, a few weeks ago, was 96%. So we were able to uh, grasp previously unseen objects with 96% success rate. But there's a little caveat that I didn't tell you about. So this 96%, this result, was achieved with this data set. It was 580,000 offline trajectories, plus a very small portion of online trajectories as well. So it's 28,000 trajectories collected online. And that's what led to 96%. Now, we also evaluated the performance of the system only on the 580,000 offline trajectories without any online data collection. All right, so this is the offline, off, uh, sorry, offline reinforcement learning case. There is no on-policy data collection whatsoever. And you can tell that you know, the fraction of online data collection is so small that it's very unlikely that this small fraction of data, the small additional uh, data set, has uh, suddenly you know, boosted generalization in some crazy way. It's probably, if it, if it helped, it's probably because of the fact that it's online, not because of the fact that it's 28,000. So if we run just this, just on this data, and we apply our QT algorithm, we get the result of 87%. And it might seem not that big of a difference, but if you look at the error rate, here the error rate is 4%, here the error rate is 13%. So it basically, uh, we can cut it in three times, right? But with just extra 25,000 um, online trajectories. So there is something going on here where the online data collection is really, really important and it can boost our results significantly. Um, so let's take a look at what's going on in the offline case. Why isn't working it? Why, why isn't, it, isn't it working as well as it should? Right, so let's talk about some offline RL, the, the problem and the, and the solutions. All right, so in terms of the problem, we talked about the main equation in Q learning, the, the Bellman equation. So just to repeat, we say that the optimal Q function is equal to this expectation over dynamics of the reward at the current step plus the max of the Q function at the next step. So let's analyze this situation that we had in the previous slide. And we'll analyze it on this half cheetah environment. It's a popular environment used in reinforcement learning. So the way we would analyze it is the following. We would collect a bunch of trajectories while we are training this agent to run forward as fast as possible. And we'll train it on policy uh, or using an off policy algorithm that will collect data in the meantime. And we can get it to a mediocre performance that achieves the performance of around uh, 5,000. That's the reward that it gets. And then we'll take that data set, that RL trace, so all the data that that agent generated, and then we'll try to learn uh, the same policy but by using an offline RL algorithm. All right, so here are the two important graphs. So this shows 
the average return over the number of gradient steps if we take that RL trace and if we change the, the, the amount of data that we have access to. So we can either generate just you know, a thousand trajectories or I think in this case SARS tuples or 10,000 or 100,000 or a million of them. And we can look at the average turn, return of the agent that is training from the data set offline. And remember the policy that was collecting the data was achieving the reward of over 6,000. Here we are at around zero or actually below zero. So we are not learning anything really. Right? Even though we have data that definitely has some trajectories that can achieve higher return, um, our off offline reinforcement learning algorithm is not able to extract that. And then here on the, on the right, there's another plot which shows the log of the Q function. So basically it tries to answer the question, how well does, the, does our offline reinforcement learning algorithm thinks it does? So this, this plot on the left tells us how well it actually does, and it doesn't do very well. And the plot on the right tells us how well it, it thinks it does, right? And we can see that uh, it actually thinks that it's getting better and better for all of these cases. Right? So there is something going on here. So does anybody have any idea what, what might be wrong? Yes? Um, in the how well it does, the why is the performance better for like the smallest number of Samples. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So why is it that for a smaller number of samples we get higher Q function? Yeah, unsure. Yeah, at this point we don't know. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, so in this case, even if we make the rewards not sparse, I think actually in half cheetah they're not sparse. Um, it's still, we can't really get a good behavior for using offline reinforcement learning. Good idea though. Yes? Overestimating its performance because probably like the max over the next action is like the other optimism in which how much it predicts the key value. Right. So, um, just to repeat the, the answer, it's probably overestimating how well it's doing for the Q function because that max term over here is probably sampling some actions that we've never seen before and it thinks that those actions are doing really well. Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a really good answer. So there is something going on with this max term that is causing our algorithm to, to not do very well or our Q function to be overly optimistic. So let's analyze it a little bit, a little bit further. All right, so this is our Bellman equation. And now let's imagine that we are trying to fit our, um, to our, our neural network to a true Q function, which is what we're trying to do. And let's try to plot it like this. So the true Q function here is the plot in, in green. This is the true Q function that we are trying to fit to. And then we are doing a decent job with, with trying to fit to it and our fitted curve is the one in blue, All right? So it's, a little bit off here and there, but overall we are doing a fairly decent job. Right, so now this term right here, this max over actions for um, our learned Q function, we'll try, to fit, we'll try to find the max for the blue function, right? So in this case, the max will be this peak that we have right there. All right, and the problem with this peak is that basically the, our Q learning algorithm will try to find the max no matter what, right? So it will, it will look for the peaks even though these peaks might not be real. So it's kind of looking for the, the, uh, the part of the function where, the where we have the biggest positive error, right? Because it's just trying to find the max. So in a sense, Q-learning is an adversarial algorithm. It's trying to find the, the biggest error that we have in the currently fitted Q function, just the biggest positive error. And the reason why this, why this is happening is because we don't know the value of the actions that we haven't taken. We don't know the counterfactuals. So if you see all the data that was collected by some policy, it's really hard to tell you know, what would have happened had I taken this other action. What kind of return would I have gotten? So it's exactly as the, as the previous answer. This max over actions can query some actions that we've never seen before. And uh, that leads to a distribution shift. And then Q-learning will pick those actions because of the max operator. All right, so one question is, what happens in the online case? How come this is not a problem in the online case? Yes? Because in the online case, you have been updating your policies and resampling 
your selection action for the next iteration. So if you have like a case like this, then in the next iteration, you like the actual reward will be seen because it's been added, and so it will correct itself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So in the online case, just to repeat the answer. Um, we would we would still think that this is the the best action to take, but in the next iteration we'll actually take that action, and then we'll see that the reward for that action is not that high, and then we'll fit this curve a little bit better. We'll push it down because we'll just experience that the reward isn't as high, and this this online kind of active correction process will make sure that our Q function is is correct. In the offline case, we don't have access to that. We can't really correct for these errors. All right, so let's think about some, some solutions to offline array problem. And first we'll talk about explicit set of solutions and then about some implicit set of solutions that seem to work a little better. So just to um, reiterate the problem on a slightly different plot, here we have on the, on the y-axis the value of the Q and on the x-axis we have um, the action that we pick. And let's say that if we were to plot the distribution of the actions that we see in the buffer, of uh, pi beta, it will look like this dashed red line. All right, so we have these actions that we've actually experienced, and if we were to fit a policy to it, it would probably look like this, all right, this dashed red line. So then we can try to fit our Q function, the blue line, to this, and it would probably work fairly well based on the actions that we've seen, but then it would be completely crazy for anything else, right? Like we don't have any constraint there. We don't know what these actions um, should result in. So it will just it will experience a distribution shift. Now the biggest pick, pick will be used for the backups, right? So what we need is some kind of some kind of constraint, right? We need to somehow tell our Q function to not use these these uh, peaks right here because we don't really have support for those peaks in our data. So you can only pick the peak of your Q function that is supported by what we have seen in the buffer. So we can optimize our Q function or optimize the sum of the returns. But with this, uh, with this additional constraint saying that our policy that we're trying to learn should be relatively close to the policy that we have in the buffer. Right? So we are not able to deviate from that policy. We have to stay close to it. We can only pick among those. So now we have a few different options on how to implement this constraint. One option is to use a KL divergence constraint. So this is a, a way of measuring the distance between two distributions. So we can measure explicitly the distance between our policy and the policy of the buffer. And then we can also use another constraint, uh, a constraint that says that these two policies should have the same support. They don't have to be the same distributions. They don't have to be close in terms of the distributions, but they should have the same support. So whenever our, the policy can be, the probability of some actions can be larger than zero, only if the probability of the same actions under our uh, buffer policy is larger than epsilon. Okay. And these two differences, the, the difference between the KL divergence constraint and the support constraint are actually quite significant. So if we were to do distribution matching, so KL divergence constraint, that means that we could only pick um, policies that are very similarly looking to the policies that we have seen in the buffer. All right, so these are the, these purple policies that you see right here. These will be the policies that have relatively small KL, um, KL divergence between the buffer policy and the policy that we're learning. However, when we use the support constraint, we can use any policy as long as it has the same support as our policy in the buffer. So now it can be much more peaky, it can be you know, much sharper, um, as, but as long as it has the same support, we are okay. All right? Do you, have, uh, do you have any suggestions as to which one would be better? Which one would be better to use? The support constraint or the KL divergence constraint? Yes? Support one, I think, gives you a little more freedom. Is yeah, the support one because of more degrees of freedom. Yeah, that's correct. So with the support, with the distribution matching one, you're, uh, you're quite conservative, right? You can be only as good as the policy that you've seen in the buffer. But here we can see that this action is definitely much better than these two. So maybe we might want to be a little bit sharper, right? We, we want to make our Gaussian a little bit more uh, peaky like this one. 
But we wouldn't be able to do that because of the KL divergence constraint. So the support, the support constraint is not as conservative and it allows us to do a little bit more. It is, however, a little bit harder to implement. So people usually in this explicit methods refer to the uh, KL divergence constraint. All right, cool. So there are some methods that, um, that actually do this, and here are some references. But they actually don't work that well because of explicit representation of this pipe beta is actually quite tricky. So the most modern, modern methods do this implicitly. And I'll discuss two of them. So again, this is our function. And we are trying to uh, find the, the, the policy that maximizes the Q uh, subject to this constraint so that we have to be close to our pi beta. So this is a, a constraint optimization problem that we can actually solve via Lagrange multipliers, via duality. And uh, I won't go through the whole derivation of this, but if you're interested, there, it was actually derived a few times in a few different papers. But I think one of the most accessible ones is the one uh, described by Jan Peters et al. in the paper called REPS, Relative Entropy Policy something, Policy Optimization. All right, so the result to this equation looks like this. So our optimal policy is equal to uh, the policy of the buffer that we don't have access to, right? So the policy of the buffer that is exponentially weighted by the advantage of our policy, All right? So we can actually implement this, and I'll tell you a little bit about the intuition of what this actually means in a second. So if we were to implement this, it would look like this. Our new policy would be equal to the max likelihood objective, right? We are trying to fit our policy using the samples from the buffer. So at this point, we are just doing behavior cloning if we didn't have these terms right here, right? This is, we are just trying to fit our policy to whatever we've seen in the buffer. But then additionally, we weight it by some weight, right? So there is some weight that depends on state and action. And then this weight is exponentiated advantage. So what that means is that we would need to estimate our advantage function, which tells us how good is an action compared to all the other actions. And then we'll put a little bit more weight on the actions that are better in terms of our advantage. So we'll do this weight at maximum likelihood where we won't just copy all the actions, but we'll say that the actions that have better advantage functions should have a little bit higher weight. We want to do these actions more. And this is actually implemented in this algorithm called advantage weighted regression, as well as this algorithm by Ashwin Nair et al. Uh, called awake. All right. So there's one more algorithm. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, so this is a normalization constant, which usually we treat as a hyperparameter. Yeah. I guess all of these offline it seems to be very dependent on how good the pi beta is. So like how do you make sure that the samples you collect are representative enough to have like a good distribution to start with? Yeah, that's a great question. So the repeat the question so uh, is that uh, so far we rely that our pi beta has to be good enough so that we can find a really good solution given our support in pi beta. So how do we make sure that pi beta is really good? We don't. So we are trying to find the best policy we can, the best possible policy given pi beta. Right? So we just have access to some data set and we want to try to get the best, make the best, uh, do the best job we can given that data set. Right? And if that data set isn't very good, then our policy won't be very good, but hopefully it will be still quite good. All right. So here's um, another solution, an implicit solution that's actually fairly straightforward that seems to be working really, really well. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, is there an upper bound how well you can do given pi beta? Um, I believe that, I think it's really tricky to find that upper bound because of the way that it can be stitched, it's actually really tricky to find out what's the best possible policy you can do. You, there is a problem in offline reinforcement learning that talks about how you can rank different policies given the data set, but I'm not sure if you can upper bound it. Yeah, it's a great question. All right, cool. So there is one more solution to this problem that is an implicit solution that, is, that actually works really well and it's relatively straightforward. 
and it's called conservative Q learning. And this was introduced by Abril Kumar in 2020. So it works as following. So we have our function as, as usual. And now we have this peak that was a problem, right? So this was the peak that was just the max over actions for our Q, um, for our Q function. So what we can do is we can take that peak, right? We, we know what that peak is. This is what we do in our Q target computation for Bellman equation. And we can just push it down. We can just say every peak that we find, let's just push the value of it down, right? So let's try to do this. So this is the equation for CQL, this conservative Q learning. It might be a little complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So this second part here, this is just standard Q learning. So here we are just saying that our current Q, the difference between our current Q and the reward plus the Q at the next state um, should be uh, minimized. All right, so this is just minimizing Bellman error. But we have this additional term right here. And this additional term right here is saying that uh, we should be pushing down big Q values. So here we are trying to maximize the policy. So we are trying to find the policy that maximizes the Q, right? So this is the policy that takes that max. And then we say, take those Q values and push them down, right? So find those peaks and push each one of them down. And you can do this and it actually already works quite okay. And you can then show that the, uh, the, this Q function computed with, with this equation is uh, um, it, it's upper bounded by the by the true Q function, right? Because we're pushing kind of all the values down. So there's um, it, it already kind of works, but there's one more problem with it in that you're pushing everything down, right? So including some points that were actually seen in the data. So you can actually do a small modification to it and add one more term. So here we are pushing down big Q values, but in addition to this, we'll add this other term that will be pushing up everything that we've seen in the data, right? So here is, this is added with the negative term, uh, as a negative term. So we are pushing up, we are minimizing this whole thing, so we are pushing this up, and we are sampling actions from our data set, and we are saying uh, push up the Q values of everything that you've actually seen in the data. So what this amounts to is that we want to push everything down that we haven't seen in the data, and if we have seen it in the data, we'll push it back up. Right? So for things that we've actually seen in the data, these two terms will cancel out and we'll just do our normal Bellman equation. All right, so um, this is the, the final equation that we would use in CQL. And uh, the intuition is the following. So before what we had is, we, this is another plot of showing in the x-axis the q-value, on the x-axis our actions, and then uh, this is our true actual Q function. And let's say we have a, a very small action support in our data set. This is the, the actions that we've seen in pi beta. So if we were to fit a naive Q function, it would do a decent job in the action support case, but everywhere else it will be you know, a little bit wild and we'll pick the, the wrong values for our max operator. So in the CQL case, we'll fit this conservative Q function that will be conservative anywhere where we haven't seen any data, right? So where we don't have action support, our conservative Q function here in blue will be a little bit lower than the actual Q function. And this is okay. We want to be kind of pessimistic in this case. However, during the act, in the action support, we'll be relatively well fitted, and sometimes we will not underestimate those values. Sometimes we might overestimate them a little bit, but that might be good enough for us to, to have a good Q function. Right, so let's see how it works. So we can actually implement it fairly easily. We can just update our Q function according to this loss that we just described, where we sample data from our data set and then we update the policy and we iterate. And uh, this algorithm was actually tested on uh, three different data sets. One uh, consists of this little ant uh, robot that is navigating in a maze. There's another set of environments where they were collected some demonstrations and they were doing some in-hand manipulation skills. And another one where we had a Franca robot that was deployed in a, in a simulated kitchen and had to do a bunch of different things as well. And here are the different results showing all kinds of different baseline comparisons. So you can do behavior cloning, you can do some popular uh, self um, actor critic algorithms, other explicit methods for offline reinforcement learning. And you can see that CQL here, this part, this CQL is the one that pushes down 
the high the actions that uh, achieve high or pushes down the Q values of, of actions that we haven't seen and also has this additional term that pushes up the actions that we have seen. And you can see that this one works much better across the board than all the other algorithms and it's relatively simple. Yes, there is a question. Why would you from like SAC? Is SAC using like, does it have access to like online interaction? Yeah, so, all of the so the question was, does SAC have um, access to online interactions? No. So all of them have access just to the offline data set. Yeah. Uh, is that term that pushes down the Q values for uh, actions uh, outside of the action support, does that sort of guarantee that those Q values are going to be lower than the Q values for actions inside the support? Or is it still possible for those actions to have like a high two value even after that term? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so it does guarantee that. It guarantees that uh, because we'll be pushing all of them down, that they'll eventually be lower than the ones that we see in the action support. And there is actually proof in a paper showing that. Great question. Right, cool. Are there any other questions at this point? Cool. All right. So we learned about some solutions to this um, offline reinforcement learning problem. We know what the problem actually is. We know how we can regularize it a little bit better so that we can you know, find policies that are better than the policies that, we, uh, that, we've, uh, that we've collected before. All right, so let's, let's think a little bit about multitask reinforcement learning and how it works in the offline multitask case. So we talked already about multitask reinforcement learning algorithms and we talked about how it's relatively easy to, ch to take an existing reinforcement learning algorithm and make it a multitask reinforcement learning algorithm. We can just add an additional task identifier Z that tells us which task we're in and we can add it as part of the state. So we can then change the policy to be conditioned on the task. Uh, similarly, we can change the Q function to be conditioned on the task. And then we said that there's one difference with reinforcement learning where in addition to sharing weights between different tasks, we can also um, control the data distribution. So in addition to sharing weights, we can also share the data. Right? So we can take data generated by one task and relabel it as data that would, would have come from another task. And then we went through this one example of multitask Q learning applied to robotics called MTOpt. This is the multitask extension of QTOpt that we discussed before. And it worked as following. There is this little GIF where we collect an episode. That episode is labeled as success or failure. And then we can impersonate it or relabel it for other tasks that are a success or failure. And then use those episodes for all the other tasks. And then take a stratified batch and use it for multitask queue learning. And then we can learn many different manipulation tasks. And we talked a little bit about the, the average improvement that we get over training single tasks and how it improves more the tasks that have very little data and how we can quickly fine tune to new tasks using um, data, um, collecting new data that we require just one day of data collection and get really high performance on a task we haven't seen before. But there was, there was one thing that I mentioned when we were talking about this, which is the way we impersonate these tasks, so when we get the episode and then we have to decide whether this episode will be relabeled for this task or that one or all of them or none of them, this decision actually matters and it matters a lot. And at that time when we were working on this algorithm, we didn't understand that. Right? So we just realized that it, it's subtle. Uh, if you share data across all of the tasks, it doesn't work very well. If you, share, if you don't share data at all, it doesn't work very well either. But if you share data using some heuristics, sometimes it works really well. Right, so let's see if we can use uh, our offline RL expertise now to maybe decipher this a little bit, to see what's going on. All right, so we want to answer the question whether we can share data across, um, across distinct tasks. So we'll do this in a, in a slightly smaller environment so we can understand it a little bit better. So we'll be mixing data from three different policies. We have this 2D walker and we collected data where it tries to run forward, when it runs backward, and when it jumps. And then we put all of these data together. All right, so these are the different data set sizes for uh, these different runs. And here we vary a little bit how we collected the data. So sometimes we would get a performance that is mediocre, and we'll take the entire replay buffer that got us to that performance. 
and then we'll mix it all together and then we'll see if we don't share the data versus where we share all the data, what's the difference in the performance. So in this case, for these data sets, it seems like if we don't share the data, uh, it's a little bit better than if we do share data across all the tasks. Now, if we use slightly different replay buffers, then it seems like the opposite is true. Sharing the data is actually much better than not sharing the data at all. And then if we pick another combination, it seems like average performance is yet again better for no sharing than for sharing across all the data. And it's especially true for the task where we try to uh, jump, right? where we use actually the expert data set. All right. So remember that you know, we still have everything that applies to offline reinforcement learning, right? So we have an unknown uh, buffer policy pi beta. So this is a little peculiar, right? Like there is no, it's, it's really hard to tell what's going on here. Sometimes it helps to share data. Like in this case, sometimes it's, it really hurts. Sometimes it's better not to share. Sometimes it depends on what task you're evaluating it on. So let's look a little bit more into it. So it seems that sharing data generally helps, but it can hurt performance in some cases. So can we characterize why it hurts performance? So then we added one more, um, one more plot, one more number that we started measuring. So we actually explicitly fit a behavior cloning policy to uh, what we had in the buffer. We did this explicit method. And then we tried to, um, then we computed the KL divergence between our policy and the policy that we have in the buffer. And then you can see that, especially for, for this case right here, when we share the data, right, when we share the data across all the tasks, the KL divergence between the policy that we have in the buffer and our policy is huge, right? We're far, much further away from that policy that if we were just, if we we're not sharing data at all, right? So do you have any idea why, why that could be the case? Yeah, this is, this is a little tricky. This is a, a difficult question. All right, we'll, we'll think about it some more. But the main hint is that sharing data exacerbates distribution shift that we talked about before. All right, All right so let's talk a little bit about how, how it happens. All right, and uh, so uh, sharing data while, so sharing data does exacerbate the distribution shift, so we'll try to minimize this, but we'll first explain why that happens. So to do this, let's introduce one small piece of notation. We will assume that relabeling data from some task J, right, here depicted as DJ, to task I generates a data set DJ2I, which is then additionally used to train on task I. All right, so we can take data from task J and relabel it to task I. And this is all depicted with this symbol here. And then the effective data set for task I after relabeling will be then given by the data set that we had for that task plus everything that we relabeled from task J to task I. Right, so we kind of expanded the data set for that task as you did in homework three, for instance. Okay, cool. So what this means is that now, because we decide what kind of data set this task will have, right? Like we decide what kind of task get, or uh, which episodes get relabeled to task I, we now get to control the data set ourselves or the behavior policy, the, the policy of the buffer ourselves, right? Does, does that make sense? This is actually quite insightful, uh, uh, quite a good insight here, right? So, we, have, we still have a fixed data set that was collected for many different tasks, but now we can morph this data set into something else because we can take some data collected by one task and relabel it to another task. So we'll change the distribution of the data collected by this other task, right? Cool, are there any questions to that? Does that make sense? All right, cool. So this is now the first time where we can actually control what's in the data set in a sense by relabeling things. Cool, so, so let's use that fact to, to try to think about what's happening in this, in this multitask offline reinforcement learning. All right, so in the standard offline reinforcement learning, uh, if we were to kind of simplify our objective, it would look like this. We are trying to maximize the reward, right, according to our data set. 
So we are trying to find a policy that maximizes this. But then in addition to this, we have this regularizer towards the data behavior policy. Um, so the policy that we see in the buffer pi beta. Right? So this is the regularizer that we've been talking about. Okay. So then now, so far, we've been just trying to optimize for the best policy that we can find that will optimize this entire equation. Right? We assume that we have no control over pi beta. But we do have control over pi beta. So here we'll change the objective a little bit and we'll say the following. In addition to finding the argmax, in addition to finding our policy, now here we are operating not on just data set that we've seen, but actually this effective data, data set that includes the task that we relabel to. We'll also be able to find the best um, data, so optimize for the effective behavior policy to maximize the reward and minimize the distribution shift. So we are just now adding this additional knob that we not only have to or can optimize our policy, but we can also change what the data distribution looks like. Right? And this is, uh, this is depicted by this pi beta and this pi beta here, and the fact that our data set is now being changed by how we relabel the tasks. Okay. So now we can actually introduce a very simple way of sharing data that uh, should probably help. So it's called conservative data sharing. And we will share data only when conservative Q value will increase for that task. So what this means is the following. This is the data that we would relabel to task I. So, and we can compute the Q function for that state and action pair. And we can compare it to the Q function for the state and action pair from the data set for that task. And if, and if it's better, then we can use that, we can relabel to that task. Right? So we can t then pick and choose which episodes should be reliable to other tasks, which shouldn't, and we do this based on our conservative Q value. So we can take an episode that was, that was generated by some task, and then based on this equation, we can decide should this episode be uh, pushed into the buffer for this task, or this task, or some other task. Right? There's a question. Q function that they're using, that's the current estimate for like, the task from I, right? Yeah, the Q function that we're using is the current estimate of, of task I. It's a conservative Q function, so we're using CQL. Okay. This equation once we add any state and actions to the data set, are we allowed to remove them later on? Or, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the question is, we might have added some um, previous transitions based on our back then estimate of the Q function, can we now remove them? Yeah, so it's true, we can. So as we are iterating over the data set and we kind of decide every time how to share the data, the, this decision changes over the time of training. So we might find that initially it's better to share data across all of the different tasks, but later on maybe we should only share among these tasks or something like that. These different tasks and deciding at that current iteration which one to pick for that task at the current iteration. That's correct, yeah. So you're always deciding for any given state action pair how to relabel it. So every time you see it, you have to decide in you what kind of, what, what task you should relabel it to. Cool. All right, so, um, you know, we can implement this. We can implement this conservative data sharing algorithm and then see whether it prevents this, distrib this additional distribution share. So first, we start saying that if we do implement this, we see that the KL divergence between our policy and the policy that we see in the buffer actually goes down significantly, especially for this jump problem that we had before. So it seems that it reduces the KL divergence between the data distribution and the learned policy, so that's already a plus. But this also translates to improved performance. So for this Walker 2D case, the CDS, um, uh, the CDS algorithm is able to achieve the best result. Right. In addition to this, we also tried this on this vision-based uh, manipulation task that were actually the simulated tasks that we used in MTOpt. So the tasks included things like picking things up, putting them on a ball, and, and things like this. Things that we also had in, in the real world for MTOpt experiments. And we run a few comparisons. One comparison is to this work called Hippie, where we decide how to share tasks based on the highest return. So we'll only share the episode with another task if this other task would uh, result in high reward. 
And then we also compare to this heuristic that we designed for MTOpt, which we called a, a skill-based heuristic. So we would just uh, kind of pick the tasks that we thought should be sharing data, and we just set it manually. And then we can see that across the board, CDS is much better than any of these equivalents. It's also better than uh, sharing data across all the tasks or not sharing data at all. So it seems that we can take the tools that we just learned about from offline reinforcement learning and then use these tools to understand better what's going on in multitask reinforcement learning, whether it's online or offline, and understand better the, the underlying problem and then use these tools to design better task sharing algorithms or task relabeling algorithms that then help the overall performance. All right, cool. So we talked about offline multitask RL and how it influences data sharing. Are there any questions at this point? All right, cool. So now the, uh, the, the last part, which is offline goal condition reinforcement learning, which I believe is one of the most exciting parts in reinforcement learning these days. So uh, I'm particularly excited about this topic. If you have any questions, please just shout out and uh, we'll, we'll try to go through this and hopefully I can get across my, my excitement about this. All right, so we talked a little bit about goal condition reinforcement learning with hindsight relabeling. That was the topic of homework three. And the way it worked was the following. We were collecting some data using some policy where the, the reward was associated with the goal that we wanted to achieve. And then we would store that data in the replay buffer. And then we can perform additional hindsight relabeling where we can relabel the experience in the data that we just collected where we can use last state as the goal. So we can kind of pretend that this was the plan that we wanted to get to. And then we can relabel it with that reward and store that relabel data in the replay buffer and then update the policy using this. All right, we also talked about other relabeling strategies, how we can use any state from the trajectory, not just the last state and relabel to that. So now the question is, what happens if we do it fully offline? All right. And now little, uh, okay, little, little caveat to this is that if we can do this fully offline, what does that mean? So that means that now we can take any data set, right? Any data set that has some trajectories in it. It just needs to have states and actions. It doesn't need to have rewards, right? It doesn't need, we don't need to collect additional data for it. Um, it doesn't need to have tasks, nothing like this. We can just take any data set that has trajectories and apply this hindsight goal condition offline reinforcement learning algorithm that we will design in a second to it and learn something from it. Right? We can combine multiple data sets. We, we kind of remove tons of requirements that we had before, where we needed to have rewards, we needed to have tasks, and all these other things. Now we don't need any of this. Right? We can just take any data set, relabel all the states that we've accomplished to the goal states, and then use offline reinforcement learning. We don't need any online interactions and learn from all of that. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, so the rewards, we can just automatically set based on the states that we've actually achieved. So we can just set that the reward function is very simple. It's a sparse reward function that says, if you got to that state, you get reward one, and otherwise you get reward zero. And we can do this for any, um, any data set. So in a sense, we do need rewards, but we, kind of, we can design them on, uh, on the spot. Yeah, we don't need the reward function that was used for the data set. So this, was, this would finally put us in the situation where we can access lots of data, lots of big data sets that are out there that we used in supervised learning. Now we can also do this for reinforcement learning. All right, so let's talk about how we can do this. And this is the work that was done by Yevgen Chebotar um, called Actionable Models. And the motivation for this work was actually a little bit different. So the motivation for this work was the following. We had this data set that we collected with MTOpt where we had the robot doing all kinds of different things. And we wanted to scale up the number of tasks that the robot was doing. So here we used like 12 ablation tasks. We got to maybe 16 or 20 tasks or so on. But at some point we realized that actually when we try to scale this up, the, the task definition themselves become a bottleneck. It's actually uh, surprisingly tricky to just sit down and think about what kind of different things the robot can do given its constrained workspace, constrained action space, and so on. And if you want to do you know, thousands and thousands of tasks, it's actually difficult to, to come up with all of them yourself. So then we thought, well, goal state is a task, right? It's, a, it's an insight that, that you already know as well. 
Um, so we can get rewards through hindsight relabeling. Right? We can relabel the, um, the episode and then set that the reward for accomplishing the, the last state is just one, everything else is zero. And this way we can get lots of different tasks. Right? Like every episode would give us a task. A task would be just defined by the goal image. But then there's one more problem. If we do this, then we'll generate only positive examples. Right? We'll only tell the robot how to achieve something, what to do. But we won't really tell it what not to do. So in addition to this, we thought, well, let's employ conservative Q-learning to create artificial negative examples so that we can tell it what not to do as well. All right, so here's a little, uh, oh, one second. There's, here's a little GIF showing how it works. Just, um, but we'll go over, over this in detail. Uh, but one second, let it start from the, from the beginning. All right, so we take an episode from MT up. This is the video of that episode. And we can take all the states from that. We then artificial, we can regularize our Q function based on artificial negatives. And we can take all the subsequences, relabel the last state as the goal, and then use that little episode for the actionable model training where we do offline reinforcement learning. And actually, the, the infrastructure and the algorithms that we use are very similar to MTOP, except now this is goal condition. And we do this artificial negatives and relabeling with the goals. All right. So there's a few more interesting points about this. So if we learn something like this, it gives us something like a world model, like what you learn about in model-based RL lectures, right? where it's independent of the reward. It's just a model that tells you how the world works. So this is actually qu quite similar. right? This, this kind of gives us an, a functional understanding of the world. It tells you that given my current image and some image that I want to get to, what's the probability that I will actually get there? Right? How likely it is that I'm able to achieve that future? And it's task independent. It's all based on the goal images. Right? There is no tasks involved. It's just images. But in addition to a world model, it also gives you an actionable policy. So not only it tells you, well, how probable is it that I can get from this state to that state, but it can also tell you, well, what's the action that will take me there? Right? Like you can find the best action according to your goal condition Q function and take that action, and that's the best action that the model thinks will get you there. And then in addition to this, we can use it as an unsupervised objective for robotics or for reinforcement learning. Right? We don't need any supervision. We don't need additional rewards and so on. We can take any data set and just apply it to it and just see what happens. And then we can use it for zero-shot visual tasks. So we can present it a goal image that it's never seen before and see how well it does. But we can also use it as an unsupervised pre-training that we can then use further for downstream fine-tuning. Cool. So let's see how it works. So we start with this offline data set of, of robotic experience. So these are just some trajectories that, we, that we've collected. In this case, these were um, precisely the trajectories that we collected with, with the empty out setting. And then we can relabel all of these trajectories and all of their subsequences with goals and markers and mark as successes, similarly to what you're doing in homework three. So at this point, we have all these trajectories and the sub subsequences of those, but they're all successful. Right? So we have this problem that the Q function just knows what to do. All right. So to, to resolve this, we'll use some of the instances that we just got from offline reinforcement learning. We'll create artificial negatives. And it will work as follows. So right now, we have uh, only positive examples. We need some negatives. So we'll employ this conservative strategy where we say we'll minimize the Q values of actions that we have not seen. So very similar to what CQL was doing. Right? We'll just say that if, I, if these are the actions that I have seen, right? these are the actions that I just relabeled, these are the positives. I will also sample some actions that I've never seen. And I'll just minimize the Q values of the, on those. But in particular, I won't be just sampling any action. I'll be sampling the actions that the Q function currently thinks are particularly good. Right? I'll be just pushing down on those peaks that we were talking about. So we'll sample contrastive artificial negative actions, and we'll sample them according to the exponent of the Q. So we'll ask our Q function, what do you think about this action? If it thinks of it very highly, then we'll push down the value of it. Right? It's very similar to CQL. You can think of it as CQL just in the goal condition learning. Cool. 
All right, so we can take these relabeled sequences and add conservative action negatives and mark those as failures. And at this point, we already have a, we can consider training a goal condition Q function that should be able to accomplish any goal that it's seen inside the trajectory. All right. But there's one more little caveat. So at this point, we'll learn how to get from any point or from a starting point in a trajectory to any goal in that trajectory, right? So I can get from here to here, I can get from here to here, and from here to there. But I don't really know how to get from here to here, for instance, right? I don't know how to get from beginning of one trajectory to the end or the middle of another trajectory. We don't really know how to chain these goals. We don't know how to chain them across the episodes. We can, so far we've been only doing it within an episode. Right? So, so let's think about how we can, how we can do this. Are there, are there any ideas how we could, how we could accomplish this? Yes? Can we just hope that it generalizes? Can we just hope that it generalizes? Yes, I think that's one option. Um, that, you know, maybe the goal that we've accomplished in this trajectory looks similar to the goal that we've accomplished in this trajectory, and then it will generalize and it will work. Yes? I see. So if two states are similar for within the same trajectory. I see. We can merge two different trajectories from those from that point, right? So we would need to know which states are similar, right? Or find some kind of similarity metric. Yeah, I think something like that could work. Yeah, we would need to probably find, you know, how to how to tell whether two states are similar or not. But yeah, that's that's probably possible. Mm -hmm. Any any other ideas? All right, cool. So this is actually an, a practical problem that we had. So with MTOpt, we collected trajectories for two different tasks. Uh, this is just an example for two different tasks. So we had a, a picking task. And a picking task would start with the arm being withdrawn from the bin. And it would end with the arm having something in the gripper. Right? And that would be the end of the picking task. And then it would have a separate task called placing task. So it would be a separate trajectory. So let's say this is the picking task. It would start at the arm being withdrawn. And it would end with the image of the arm holding something. And then it would have a second trajectory, a second task, that was a placing task which would start from the image of the arm holding something in the gripper, and it would end with the arm withdrawn and the object in the, in the ball or something like that. Right? So it would be a different trajectory that now starts when this other task ended, and it ends in a, at a very different goal image. Right? So there's almost no intersection between these traje two trajectories, except maybe you know, the last image of this one is similar to the first image of this one. Sometimes not even that. All right. So in that case, we can't really ask a robot to, uh, you know, starting from an arm withdraw state, to put something on a, in a ball because it just, it's never seen that, that goal from this initial state. All right. So we'll do this through a an, an procedure called goal chaining. And it will be very similar to, to what you described. All right. So we'll just sample random goals, random images from our data set. Right? Any random image goes. We'll just sample random images from the data set. And then we'll recondition our trajectory on that random goal to enable chaining goals across episodes. Right? So we can just take our trajectory, sample a random state, and just say, well, what would happen if that trajectory is conditioned on that goal state? Yes, there's a question. Right, so the question is what action do you use because you just took a random state and there was no action associated with it? Yeah, so we just use it as a potential goal state. So for the goal state, you don't need an action. Right, so our Q function is state, action, and the goal. So we just set the goal state for the, the, the random state, but we still have states and actions from our current trajectory. Right? So these would be negative or yeah, most, most of them will be negative. That's right. So now, if a pathway, if there exists a pathway to that goal, 
dynamic programming will find will prop will find that path and will propagate that reward, right? If there is some similarity between the states, like you were saying, dynamic programming itself through generalization will be able to find the state and then say, well, the Q function for this is actually quite high. You can get to that goal, right? I found a pathway through the episodes. For instance, in the picking and placing case, I found that you know if you just continue, you will actually get to the goal you want to. And we'll find that pathway and it will set the Q function correctly. But if there is no pathway to the goal, as you said, the conservative strategy will minimize those Q values. And then because of that, we want erroneously think that we can get there even though we can't. Cool. So now we can recondition on any random goal and it should work. All right, so we added these conservative action negatives. We added a random goals for goal training. So we are now ready to train a goal condition Q function. And we do this using um, continuous um, action Q learning, like in MTOpt, we already have these conservative actions. So, so we can do this, we just condition an, an additional goal image. All right, so we talked about two applications and first of them was goal reaching, right? So we can see if we can reach certain goal images. All right, so let's try this and again, this is um, the exact same data set that we used for MTF. We didn't collect any additional data. All right, so actually let me pause this for a second. All right, so here in the top right, you can see what the robot sees currently. This is the live stream from the camera image of the robot. And here in the bottom right, you can see the goal image that we requested. All right, so here you can see that the goal image we requested is that the robot is holding a carrot inside its gripper and the gripper is on the right. So now the robot will try to do anything it can to get to an image that looks very similar to this image. So it, that doesn't only mean that you, know, you have to pick the carrot, it also means that you have to position your arm correctly so it looks the same and all the other objects look the same and so on. All right. All right. So this is an example of picking a carrot that seems to be doing a decent job. Now we are asking it to pick a grasp corn cob by showing an image of that. It seems to be doing this as well. Now it tries to do this with a broccoli. And then we can also do this container placing. So here we show an image of a carrot being inside the container. And you can see that it puts the carrot there and then it positions the arm so that it's similar to the goal image. Here we can also show the goal image of a banana being in a ball and the robot tries to accomplish that goal image. Here it also moves broccoli into the ball and then it moves the ball a little bit so that it matches the goal image. It can also do a rearrangement task and it tries to do a decent job at it. It's, it's okay, where it moves one object to be on the other side of the other. Here it moves the carrot away from the tomato. And you can see that very often it doesn't push the object, it picks them up and drops them, which is very similar to experiences that it experienced in MTL where we are picking and placing things. So it's trying to stay within this pi beta distribution. Here you can also move some cupcakes away move broccoli and banana. And then we also, have, we've also, I think maybe we'll see this next. We've seen some, uh, you can see that sometimes it like it tries to push it over and over so that it gets closer to the goal image. And eventually it, it almost gets there. And then we also tried to, to test it on objects that it's never seen before. So we've never seen the silver spoon before but it seems that it can still kind of figure out what actions would take you to this goal image that also involves the silver spoon, even though you've never seen that silver spoon before. So it pushes the spoon towards the ball. This is the same with an, uh, another example of an unseen object. In this case, it's a fork that is being moved towards, towards the cupcakes. And then, and then we try to categorize some of these results and we kind of do this post factum. So you know, we just look at them and kind of try to see what, what these would correspond to. And we then try to measure the success rate. So for instance, grasping goal images, we get to 92% for rearrangement, 74% and container placing 66%. Yep, there's a question. Right. So the question is, how does the robot decide to stop moving? So it has an additional action, which is called the terminate action. So if it sends that action, that means it terminates and then uh, we decide the reward. All right, cool. And here it also plays with some another unseen object. And this is a deformable object that is actually quite tricky to manipulate and it's never seen this before, but you know, pokes around and tries to do something with it. Yes? So all images here, were they um, 
Right, so the question is, how do you get the goal images? Um, yeah, so in this case, we are manually doing this, which kind of you know, defeats the purpose of the entire exercise, right? Because you have to accomplish the task first to show it to robot what you want it to do, and then it does it again. Um, but it's mostly to show that this unsupervised objective seems to be working, right? Like it seems that it's going to accomplish certain goal images. However, as an interface, it's not a great interface, right? It might work in some cases. Maybe you want to take a picture of a clean room, and you want to ask the robot to always bring it back to that state. But it doesn't make sense maybe for tasks like that, where you, know, you need to move certain thing to a certain other place, and then you have to do it yourself first. Mm -hmm. Right, cool. So we talked a bit about how it can reach goals, and it's not the best interface. But we also before talked about how it can be used as an unsupervised pre-training for downstream tasks. Right? We can kind of use it on any data set, let's just unsupervised pre-train on everything and kind of see how it does uh, when we fine tune it to something we care about. All right, so we did this in simulation first. So here we did it in two different ways. We either use it as pre-training, so we pre-train it with this goal condition Q function with actionable models, or as an auxiliary objective. Right? So we would be training both at the same time, the task and actionable model. Or we can just not use it at all. So for simulation tasks, these are the results. So we can see that by using the pre-training mechanism or auxiliary objective, we get to a higher, re not only to a higher reward, but we also get there much faster. So it seems that this functional understanding of the world that we got from actionable models actually helps for downstream tasks, for downstream fine tuning. And then we also uh, tried it on, on real world data, where we have very small amount of data for a particular task. And for these tasks, if we don't pre-train, we get very, very bad performance. With pre-training, we can get to reasonable performance and we can continue fine tuning to get better and better. All right, so we talked about offline RL problem formulation, why it's important. We talked about some solutions to it, and then we used some of those insights to, to think a little bit about how to share data between different tasks in multitask RL, and then finally how to do offline goal condition reinforcement learning, which removes a lot of the obstacles from a reinforcement learning pipeline and allow us to use reinforcement learning on big data sets without any rewards tasks and so on. And uh, for next time, for Wednesday, we'll talk about long horizon tasks, how we can solve them with hierarchical reinforcement learning, with skill discovery. And as a reminder, homework four is due next Monday. I'm happy to take any questions, but thanks to all of you for your attention. <laughs>